And if you would open your Bible to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20 and verse 17. Psalm 119, 103 says, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. The words that we're about to read are the best, sweetest, most valuable thing we could possibly hear this morning. And the passage we're looking at, in my view, is like a banquet. So in some ways, I am praying that just by reading this passage, it will minister and transform. So let me encourage you, even as we read, open your heart to receive the transforming, authoritative value of God's Word. Let's begin reading Acts chapter 20, verse 17 through the end of the chapter. Now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor is precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold... I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to All the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was Much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. When my daughter Ellie was born, I have this distinctive memory of a nurse holding her, and Ellie was fine, and Lori was fine, but there was a checking her or something, and, and 
And the nurse was rushing to get her back to her mommy, wanted to get her to her mommy uh, after birth, obviously. Uh, And I remember thinking from this young dad's perspective, uh, hold on there, you're moving way too fast uh, on this tile floor, slow down, I do not want to witness you tripping and dropping my infant daughter, please slow it up there. And I'm sure you can imagine, anybody can relate to the kind of concern you would have. Look, look, be careful, be careful, you are holding my heart in your hands. Uh, Please be careful with the treasure that you are carrying, the treasure that you are watching over right now. I think Paul shares a similar passion in this parting exhortation to these pastors. Be careful with what you are carrying. Be careful with what you are watching over. Be aware of how valuable it is that I have given and entrusted to you. Be careful. Watch over it well. You are holding my heart in your hands. What I'd like to do this morning is to walk through this exhortation, just provide some sort of summarizing commentary, overview comments, and then I want to spend uh, the second half of the message just applying some of the values of this speech, this parting speech, to our church, to our situation. Um, We see from the opening verse in verse 17, Paul is, uh, we know he's traveling and he's at Miletus, which is about 30 miles away from the large city of Ephesus where he had ministered for a number of years, and he calls the elders of the church to come to him. So this is a, a meeting. He didn't want to go into Ephesus, perhaps to avoid some of the persecution there, or perhaps he just didn't have time to minister further. He's, he's urgent, it says in the previous verses, to get to Jerusalem. He's probably bringing an offering to the Jerusalem church. It's always important for him to build unity with that church. So he's in a hurry, and so he calls the pastors of the church and brings them, and he has this lengthy speech. And I have to confess, this speech is perhaps one of my favorites, if not my, my very favorite, uh, section of the book of Acts. Uh, Acts is relentless. You just never end. You just keep coming uh, to profound moments, profound teaching. And, and I think I was telling Aaron, uh, he was asking me how my preparation was going this week. I was saying, you know, th- this, this chapter could be a, a, a series in and of itself. I mean, there's so many values that Paul is proclaiming as he, he has this very succinct speech that he brings to these pastors, and it's just packed, packed with value. And as we walk through it, I think we can see he's, he begins by looking backward at the model of his ministry. He, he calls to their mind, you yourselves know, he says in verse 18, how I lived among you. He calls to mind his character, that he served with humility and with tears. I think that's a reference probably both to his earnestness and to his suffering. And he references his suffering, that he, he faced trials from the Jews, That his ministry was, in the face of suffering, faithful, though, to the word. Notice in verse 20 how he did not shrink from declaring anything that was profitable. Paul was not interested in only teaching popular doctrine. He was interested in teaching whatever was necessary. You want to notice also that his teaching is both public and in a a small group private kind of context. So it's comprehensive. It's also uh, inclusive. He's willing to preach to Jews and to Greeks, and it has a center point. His focus is repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus. Paul is not uh, sort of just a, a systematic theologian where he just hits various topics however he chooses to on that day. He has a focus to his teaching. He brought them the appeal, the claim of repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus as the Messiah. This is the focus of his teaching. So what he does, first of all, is he reminds them of what they know. You, you saw how I ministered among you. You saw the character that I sought to exhibit. You saw the way I endured suffering. You saw the comprehensive nature of my teaching. You saw that I did not neglect any biblical topic that was necessary for you. You, you saw that I was inclusive in my teaching. I wasn't excluding people from hearing it. You saw that it was public and also private in some measure. You saw how I ministered. He calls this to their mind. It's very important that we understand that Paul is not 
is not bringing this model to mind as a form of self-congratulations uh, or boasting. He's not exalting himself before them. That They don't owe him uh, some kind of monetary remuneration at this point. No, he, he's bringing this to mind because he's going to call them to follow in his footsteps. This happens again and again in the New Testament. Paul is presented in the New Testament as sort of the, the non-divine model of ministry to the church. There, there's other models, Peter at some level, and John perhaps at some level, but, but primarily we have the biographical description of Paul. Now, now, nobody today has his authority or the scope of his ministry, but the character and the content of his ministry, he is determined to pass on to the church. It, it's crucial that we see this. Otherwise, it, it makes no sense the many places in the New Testament that Paul's biography is referenced, both in the epistles and in Acts. Paul's manner of ministry is referenced over and over and over again. It's referenced in First and Second Timothy, in Titus, throughout Acts, and in all of his, many of his epistles anyway, there's some biographical references. The reason that is, is because every generation is called to fulfill Paul's legacy of ministry. The, the ministry of the church, the calling of the church, it is not new in every generation. Thank the Lord for that. Pastors and churches, they're, they're not called to innovate, they're called to repeat. They're, they're not called to invent a new method of church, they're called to reflect the method and the character and the content of ministry that has come before them. Paul functions as this sort of model pastor. Of course, he's more than a pastor, but he's not less than a pastor. And he represents ministry in the church. And so he calls this to mind and, and reminds them of the kind of enduring, Bible-saturated, persevering teaching that he did relentlessly in their city. And then, and then he looks ahead. Notice this. Notice he looks ahead. Verse 22. Now he says, behold, I am going to Jerusalem. He makes it clear that this trip to Jerusalem is not mere preference. Somehow, the Spirit has indicated to Paul, whether through prophetic ministry or through his own prayer time, that this is his next step in ministry. But simultaneously, he's told that the only thing that he knows for sure is that imprisonment and afflictions await him. Now, I want us to zero in on this amazing juxtaposition. Paul's sure he's supposed to go to Jerusalem, and he's sure that what awaits him is imprisonment and affliction. Try to put that together. The one thing Paul knows for sure is that this path of obedience will lead to suffering. But we need to build this into our theology. Can God call his church to suffer? Yes, according to Paul. The one thing he knows for sure is that there is a path of obedience that is laid before him. There is something he must do, and that path constitutes suffering. He doesn't know what else is going to happen. He doesn't know what fruit is going to be born. He doesn't know the outcome of his ministry in Jerusalem. He doesn't know how long he'll suffer. He only knows this is the path of obedience, and that path is certainly a path of suffering. It's important to build into our theology contrary to maybe popular teaching that would say God's best for you is never to suffer. Paul does not agree. He doesn't choose suffering. It's not like he wants to suffer, but this path for him is certainly a path of suffering. Now, you could see this as a juxtaposition, and actually, people are going to begin to argue with Paul. No, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. If you're going to suffer, you shouldn't go to Jerusalem, Paul. You're too important. You're too valuable. We need you free. But Paul anticipates that argument, and he makes it clear in verse 24 why he is content with this path of obedience covered in suffering. Why is he content with this? Why is he okay to walk down this road that is painful obedience? Why is he okay with it? Verse 24, I do not account my life of any value. 
nor is precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Compared to faithful fulfillment of his calling, Paul counts earthly comfort of no value. It's not that Paul hates comfort or hates ease or hates freedom or wants, you know, a life of suffering. No, it's, it's a little bit like, it reminded me, uh, you know, there's these great um, Subaru commercials that they have now, and Subaru does a great job because they have this kind of abrupt picture of this young teenage guy on the phone in the midst of what is obviously an accident, and he gets on the phone with his mother, and he says, Mom, I've got some bad news for you. I've wrecked your Subaru. And you can feel his grief and his sadness and his sense of, of responsibility. And his mother says, it doesn't matter. You're safe. That's all that matters. Now, I suspect that in one sense, it matters a lot. It matters a lot that there is no car anymore, and that matters a great deal. And in a normal kind of everyday way of thinking, this actually has a lot of value. This isn't a paper airplane, okay? This is a car. It has a lot of value. It's not that it has no value. It's just that compared to faithful fulfillment of his calling, it's irrelevant. It's not that Paul likes prison or likes suffering. It's that his comfort compared to his faithfulness is irrelevant. It's accounted of no value. What a lesson for these pastors. Of course, of course, he values his freedom. Of course, he values his comfort. Of course, he values his access to all of these churches that he loves and he wants to care for. Of course, he doesn't want to be beaten again. Of course not. But compared to finishing his course faithfully, it says nothing. I count my life of no value compared to that. For Paul, faithfulness is vastly more valuable than personal comfort. Very important. And what, what, does he, what does he say this for? All of Paul's personal model here is not just biographical, it's motivational. We need to feel that's the way the passage flows. He doesn't just reference himself to say, and look at me, my self-sacrificing awesomeness. No, he, he's leading towards a calling for them. This builds towards them. The legacy I'm leaving you is what you must fulfill. Paul's ministry, pastorally at least, is not one and done. It's one and repeated in every successive generation. Now he says, behold, I know that none of you among whom I've gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, he says, here's the point. Here's where it builds to all of my legacy of pastoral faithfulness to Christ and to his church. It's building to this. Therefore, because I am leaving, I testify that I am innocent of the blood of all. He's just following in his prophetic footsteps of those that came before him. Samuel did something similar when he laid down his prophetic mantle and ended his life. He basically said, look, you need to be aware that whatever happens in the future, you have yourselves to blame. Whatever happens in your ministry going forward, I have done all that I can do to position you for faithfulness. And now it's on you. It's now on you, he says. Remember, I haven't left out anything. He repeats the same word. I haven't left out any part of God's word. I have not shrunk from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. So what does this mean for you, Ephesian pastors? What is he saying? What does it mean for you, pastors, that I will not be there to help you anymore? What should you do? Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. To do what? To care for the church of God. Why? Because he obtained it with his own blood. What's Paul saying? He's saying, you are responsible now to care for this church, to watch over it carefully, to ensure its spiritual well-being. Why? Because it is priceless. It was purchased by the blood of Christ. And not only is its purchase price reveal its value, but its vulnerability reveals the need for your watchfulness. Notice, he says in 29, I know fierce wolves will come in. 
The overwhelming metaphor in the scripture for the leader of God's people, pastors, is the shepherd who guards and watches and protects and nourishes the flock. But the contrast of that is the false teacher who comes in looking to devour, who leads astray for their own ends and appetites, who deceives for the purpose of devouring. And he says, this is going to happen in the church. Why do you have to watch? Because the church is of infinite value and because false teachers will come in among you looking to devour. They will deceive for the purpose of devouring. Brothers, you have my heart in your hands. Pay careful attention. Fulfill my legacy. Earnest, biblical enduring care and watchfulness for the souls of this flock because they are in danger from false teachers. Those teachers will speak twisted things, drawing away disciples after them. Therefore, brothers, be alert. Remembering, again, my example, I didn't cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. But ultimately, brothers, he says, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. So that in the end, even your efforts are not finally your confidence. Finally, it is God and the preaching of the gospel. God and the word of his grace. And they are able to build you up and to give you the inheritance. Brothers, finally, my confidence, he says, is not ultimately in your perseverance. It's finally in that the preaching of the gospel is sufficient to preserve the church. He reminds them finally in this concluding exhortation that that his, his work towards the church was not for his own material benefit. He said, I I didn't covet anyone's gold. I'm not like some of these false teachers that are simply looking to benefit materially from the church. Quite the contrary, I laid down my right of receiving benefit and I worked both as a preacher and as a tent maker at times to provide and to give because I, I wanted you to have a clear sense that laboring to give is more valuable than expecting to receive. As he says, the Lord Jesus told us, it is more blessed to give than to receive. What what, what do you see throughout this, woven throughout this final exhortation? What do we see? The sacrificial servant reflecting his Lord in caring for the church. The sacrificial servant reflecting his Lord in caring for the church. Jesus said the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He gives. He does not demand And every leader of any Christian, and especially in this case, pastors, should be following in that same legacy. Caring, watching, pay careful attention. Don't lose sight of those who are seeking to devour for their own ends, speaking twisted things. Remember that you work hard. Why? Because the soul should be to give and not to get. Finally, after this exhortation, they gather together, they pray. You can feel the emotion of this moment. They're weeping, they're embracing him because they won't see him again. And surely the sobriety of this charge, imagine the Apostle Paul looking you in the eye as the pastor of this young pastor of this Ephesian church and saying, you pay careful attention to this flock Because you have my heart in your hands and you must be faithful to your course just as I have been. And when you suffer, you must persevere and you must work hard and demonstrate that it's better to give than to receive. You must lay your life down for the people of God. What's he saying to this next generation of church leaders? He's saying, look, every, every generation, every generation must fulfill Paul's legacy of gospel ministry. Paul's ministry for Christ and for his church must be fulfilled in the church of every generation. It must be fulfilled. It must be fulfilled. Paul expects that his content and character in ministry will be repeated generation after generation. The precious church is now entrusted to their care. They will not see Paul again. 
each generation is not free to assign their own value system and ministry pattern toward Christ and his gospel. The legacy that Paul has laid down must be fulfilled. Now, I think the, the primary target of this church is towards pastors. That the church is called to have pastors that have this heart towards the church. And so certainly Aaron and I receive this, this passage as aimed squarely at us. But I think by implication, it also aims at the heartbeat of the church as well. And I just want to reference four values that I think we can derive as we kind of receive this emotional appeal from Paul. Four values that I think we can pull out. And I, there's probably more than those, but I thought these four would be of particular uh, value to us as we seek to fulfill Paul's legacy of caring for the church of God. Four values. Number one, the value of the church. The value of the church. Notice back there where it says, notice that it is the church of God that he purchased with his own blood. And notice that all of Paul's efforts in and of themselves reveal how valuable this church is. Brothers and sisters, we need to have this kind of passionate affectionate, zealous, determined view of God's people as well in their individual state and in their corporate state. This is the church of God that he purchased with his own blood. Any church of genuine professing Christians who believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and submit to scripture, this is the church of God that he purchased with his own blood. Paul says, cherish it, value it, love it. Don't you dare discount how valuable this is. Don't you rush along with life. The church is in your hands. That's true in a leadership sense of pastors, but it is also true of Christians who minister to one another and who live among the church in and out. And and I I just want to echo what Aaron said and and, and what Chase was saying. Look, this is what it means to value the church. It's saying, look, these are people that are bought by the blood of Christ that, that, that should be valued and loved and cherished This should be the heartbeat of every faithful pastor to love the church of God. And by the grace of God, it is our heartbeat towards you. You were bought by the blood of Christ and we dare not value you any less. Value of the church. The faithful generation of following in Paul's legacy, and this is true throughout his epistles, everything he says and writes, a faithful church must value the church at the price tag of the blood of Christ. And at the estimation of Paul's tireless and relentless ministry. That's what it means to fulfill Paul's gospel legacy. Second value, the value of biblical pastors. This is obvious. I've made a number of points here, but I wanted to make it explicit. It's it's worth noting that all of the references here, the the biblical teaching and earnestness for the church, it's being entrusted to a defined group of men who are called to care for the church in a particular way. Now, the whole church should care for itself, and we know that from the book of Ephesians and elsewhere that the church ministers to each other. But but it's just, it's worth not losing the context here. What does Paul do? He gets to Miletus. He calls a group of men who have received this particular responsibility. And and I think it's valuable, especially in our culture, which has a a certain uh, kind of egalitarianism. and, And in some ways, that's good that there's not an exaltation of these individuals as though they're kind of valuable in their own right. No, of course they're not. They're not more impressive in their own right. Pastors aren't, you know, closer to God in some way or more... I mean, you you have plenty of examples here. Just look at us. Obviously, uh, we're not impressive in our own rights, but the office, the calling, is the way God has chosen to care for his church. And, and, And we should 
love that and value that, that the chief shepherd calls under shepherds to pay careful attention. Sometimes I think one of the downsides of the digital age, and there's a lot of upsides, is the illusion that Christians are called to self-pastor. The, the illusion that Christians are called, and I use that phrase self-pastor, I just mean that, look, I, I can kind of create my own diet of pastoral care. This message here, and, and I can read over here, and I can pick this up off a blog and so forth. I, I sort of self-pastor. I, it's sort of the buffet <laughs> available to me, and, and I can kind of self-feed. And in some ways, that's wonderful, the access that we have to wonderful ministries and things that I read and you read and listen to. But we don't want to lose sight of the fact that left to ourselves, all of us, pastors included, are sheep that need personal watchfulness. Sheep aren't designed to self-pasture. That's not the way sheep are. And God didn't pick this metaphor on accident. It's not like the sheep wakes up and says, hmm, like, which pasture shall I go to today? No, you need somebody that knows that sheep. The sheep doesn't think, oh, and, and today shall be a, a still water day, and, and today shall be a, a, a bush nibbling day, and today shall be a day of traveling over the mountains. No, that's not the way sheep work, and every sheep, including pastor sheep, uh, need a personal shepherd. So what does Paul do? He calls the pastors. It's worth noting in this passage that the same phrases, elder, overseer, shepherding the flock of God, where we get the word pastor from, they're intertwined here. So there's this office in the church that God calls men to watch over the spiritual well-being, to discern their particular needs, their particular temptations, their particular, uh, you know, uh, vulnerabilities as they face the culture and their temptations of their own sin. Now, now, I'm not speaking this correctively because you do a wonderful, wonderful job of upholding and, and honoring and encouraging faithful pastoral ministry. But it's worth noting this is built into the scriptures. We, we don't want to subtly give in to the idea uh, that's common in our culture of the, the self-shepherding sheep. Now, a sheep without a shepherd is always vulnerable. A sheep that thinks that they can self-shepherd is in danger. The value of biblical pastors. Third value. The value of the word. Wow, don't you just see that throughout this passage? I mean, Paul says it over and over. If there's one thing he says repeatedly in this passage, it's that I testified, I preached, I didn't leave anything out. I kept communicating the truth of God and its center point, repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Do you notice that? There's this overwhelming confidence in Paul. What the church needs is the word of God. What the church needs is biblical preaching. He says, I didn't stop three years, night or day, in verse 31. I admonished everyone with tears. I, I, I preached in public. I preached in private. I preached house to house. I preached to Jews. I preached to Gentiles. I preached and I preached and I preached. And I brought the word of God. And the church needs that word. Listen, let me, let me just... Make a, a, an encouraging appeal. Encouraging because I think you do this so faithfully. But it's possible that people might not always be in this church. And, and you know, some of you young kids, you might grow up and, and move away. I hope we don't. But you might move away to some college or somewhere. Look, go to a church where God's word is proclaimed night and day. Who cares about the style of music and the lighting and whether the guy's funny or boring or what the clothes he wears or whether they have a big youth ministry or a small one? Who cares? What matters is, is the word of God proclaimed night and day? When you get with a pastor and sit down to talk about your marriage, is he talking to you about God's word? When you talk about how to train your children, is that pastor talking to you about God's word? Let the word of God be central to the church. That's what the church needs. What does Paul say? Look, follow in my manner of ministry. What is my manner of ministry? Bringing God's word to God's people. What value do we see? Paul's final emotional appeal 
And like we would know of anybody, when it's time for you to depart, what do you say? The most important things. The most important things. And what's most important to Paul is, remember how I taught you. Remember how I taught you. It's not how funny I was. It's not how we designed the church decorations. It's not the structural presence of ministry and whether we meet on this night or that night and whether we have this age group present or that age group present. No, no. Remember how I taught you. And make sure the church receives that teaching. The value of biblical teaching. Biblical teaching. Bringing God's word to bear. What I'm concerned about often in churches is that many of us as Christians, we we get a a certain uh, kind of select list of (laughs) appropriate doctrinal topics established in our minds and the need for ongoing teaching from God's word diminishes. Look, I kind of have my theology set. I have my basic morality set. But what Paul says is the need for God's word never goes away. It, It is present in the church to their dying day. Every Christian, whether they've been saved 30 years or 30 minutes, needs God's word. The value of God's word. Finally, the value of sacrificial servanthood. Again, I think this applies very directly to pastors, but since the church is called to follow the example of their pastors, and certainly to follow the example of Paul, I really think it applies to every Christian. The value of sacrificial servanthood. Isn't that present throughout this passage? I mean, throughout the passage. I serve the Lord with humility in verse 19. Notice that he says, I don't account my life of any value if only I may finish my course. He's serving. He worked to model hard work and diligence for the purpose of generosity at the end of the passage. He he just serves and serves. He doesn't account his life of any value and that's revealed constantly. He's not interested in protecting his comfort or his rights or his privileges or his exoneration or his honor. He's interested in serving and serving and serving so much so that he can say, my life, my earthly life, my freedom even, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I just want to be a faithful servant. I I just want to lay down my life. Look, all I care about, whether my life is long or short, is that I serve. That's more important to me than anything else. Brothers and sisters, the legacy of ministry for Christ and his church, it must be fulfilled in every generation. It must be fulfilled in our church, beginning with the leaders and extending to the entire church. There must be this legacy of not accounting our lives of any value, any value nor as precious to ourselves, but that we would finish our course faithfully to the Lord of agreeing with Paul that it is more blessed to give than to receive, of working hard to bless others and not to comfort ourselves. And and haven't we seen this throughout the whole book? It's not as though Paul is flattering himself, really. We've walked with him all of these miles, mile after mile, church after church, suffering after suffering, beating after beating, accusation after accusation, and again and again and again. What have we noticed? He gets up and he does it again the next day. The legacy of ministry for Christ and his church must be fulfilled in this generation. The value of the Bible, of pastoral ministry, the value of faithful servanthood. It must be fulfilled in this generation. It must be fulfilled in this church. It must be fulfilled. And and this, we want you to know, this is our heart as pastors, that that we would serve faithfully. We're, We're not interested in the size of our church being at a certain level 
or not being at a certain level. We're not interested in, in kind of the reputation publicly of our giftedness. We're interested in finishing our course for the glory of God. And this is how we will make decisions for the church. Will this honor the word of God and the legacy of Paul? Church leaders must make decisions based on these values, not based on what is popular, what is preferential. They must make decisions. Will this honor the legacy of Paul in pastoring the church? And the church must reflect that same value, those same values as well. Brothers and sisters, our life is valuable, but it is of no value compared to finishing our course faithfully. Let me ask all of us this question. Is there anything we are valuing more than finishing our course faithfully? Let's apply that across the board. Our budget, how we think about our, our, our giving to others and to the work of the gospel, our, our generosity. Is it more important to us to have a lifestyle or to finish our course faithfully? Let's think about our marriages. Is it more important to us to defend our rights and our, our privileges or to finish our course faithfully as a servant to the Lord? Our proclamation of the gospel in witness and in fellowship, we must not value our life, our comfort, our self-protection more than finishing our course. Brothers and sisters, this life is very, very brief. It's very short. It is a very short time, and much of that time is not suffering. But in the moments where we are called to suffer or called to obey in a way that is certainly going to be hard and painful, we must reflect Paul's legacy. We must reflect it that we don't account our life of any value or this particular moment of my rights of any value or being heard of any value or of, of, of being respected of any value or of having a certain financial lifestyle of any value. And no, what, what matters to us is finishing our course faithfully. And, and the good news for us is the same thing that was said to these Ephesian elders is said to us. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to bring you to your inheritance. Suffering is brief and our inheritance is eternal. Servanthood is temporary and our reward is permanent. Obedience that is difficult is temporary. But the grace that brings us to heaven is strong and the inheritance is worth not accounting this life of any value. I commend you. Isn't it wonderful? There's not a long list. Trust God and stay true to the gospel reflected in our servanthood, in our loving for the, love for the, the Bible, love for a faithful church. This is our calling. Brothers and sisters, the book of Acts is given to us so that we may pick up Paul's legacy and carry it on in our generation. Firstly, as pastors, I think in this passage, but then by implication, all of us. It must be carried on. Paul would say, you have my heart. God's people, God's glory, your faithfulness. Carry it carefully. Fulfill the legacy you have received. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that by the word of your grace and by your care,
care and comfort that we would fulfill the legacy we have received. Lord Jesus, by the power of your spirit, cause us to be faithful servants. Thank you for your grace in the past and bring us fresh grace this week to honor you, to work and serve and love as unto you. Keep our eyes fixed on that inheritance that is swiftly approaching. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to commend to you something that we do every Sunday. Uh, we have our community group leaders, they're the people that lead just small fellowship groups in our church, um, and they come forward at the end of our meeting. And the reason we do that is uh, there's just some value in even just two minutes of prayer together for our normal fellowship in the life of the church. There's a value in just sharing, I'm facing this this week, would you pray for me? Help me 